Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Orlando, Florida, where we're covering the Air Force Association's 34th Annual Air Warfare Symposium, a leading gathering of Air Force leaders as well as leaders from the industry that serves the Air Force. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS, and we're here at the General Electric stand to talk to Dan McCormick, uh, who is the General Manager for uh, Advanced Concepts, Advanced Engine Concepts at uh, General Electric uh, Military uh, Engines. Dan, thanks very much for taking some time to talk to us. My pleasure. Um, so uh, walk walk us through, um, you know, both you and Pratt & Whitney uh, are working on advanced engine concepts. Pratt & Whitney is um, uh, won uh, the F-35 engine competition. There was an alternate engine uh, that DOD was funding. Secretary Gates famously killed it. Almost everybody at the time said there will be some form of second engine competition. Talk to us about some of the twists and turns that have gotten both of you guys to the point where it's a very significant contract. It's a billion dollars. was awarded in 2016 to start developing advanced military engine concepts. Talk to us a little bit about the twists and turns that got you know that got you guys to this point. Before we talk about what you guys are specifically working on. Really, what's been happening is since the middle of the last decade, 2007, roughly, uh, all of the major engine uh, propulsion companies have been working on this concept of adaptive cycle uh, engines. Uh, it started off in the Air Force Research Laboratory with some contracts there to, to do some proof of concept uh, testing, uh, both uh, GE and some of the other uh, uh, engine manufacturers were part of that program and the follow-on programs. We've been going through a series of crawl, walk, run uh, contract stages in the technology maturation process. Uh, the beauty of that is it has in fact proven out that these technologies can provide significant improvements in combat capability, kind of getting after this lethality concept that's in the latest national defense uh, strategy. And we really talk about this technology being able to advance the combat capability in three major silos, if you will, that propulsion uh, contributes to. Certainly the one that the, was the cornerstone of the program was fuel efficiency. Uh, obviously, range has become a very big piece of the conversation uh, globally now. So the program was built off of being able to provide thrust in a much more fuel-efficient uh, manner. In addition to that is, it, is additional thrust capability. So you've got fuel efficiency, but also being able to provide additional combat thrust capability when it's desired. And actually one of the newer, uh, more influential KPPs that the engine can now play in with this engine architecture is a thermal management issue. There's a ton of avionics in these new uh, aircraft, both the current aircraft that we have and future uh, platforms. That generates a lot of heat that's very difficult to get off of the aircraft, so the engine now becomes part of the solution for managing that heat load uh, in the aircraft going forward. Um, and, and normally, you know, you're using the fuel, which is very, very cold in order to try to do that. Talk to us a little bit about your guys' specific approach. You know, when you talk to folks here, there was a lot of excitement. You know, folks were like, hey, you got to go and talk to, to GE, um, including some of my friends at Lockheed who are across the hall from you guys, uh, across the aisle from you guys, I should say. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, your approach. Um, you know, how are you driving this 30 plus percent uh, efficiency that you guys are looking at? Um, you know, and what's attractive here is that your engine form, fit, and function connectivity wise will be something that could go directly into a, not only a JSF, uh, not only the F-35, but also any of the other aircraft that are in the inventory. Talk to us about sort of the approach you guys have taken and how you guys are getting these, uh, you know, cleaner burning, hotter burning, which is good, but on the other hand, getting rid of some of that heat. Right. We really are at a perfect storm in uh, propulsion right now. Uh, if you look at lots of technologies, there are inflection points where disruptive technologies come into play, and we're really there now in these large turbofan engines, similar to the transition that happened in the 60s when we transitioned from turbojets to turbofan engines. The beauty from a GE perspective is we've had a very large investment in our commercial business, and that's all about fuel efficiency, and we're resetting the, the standards in both the small, medium, and large range uh, commercial business. Those are technologies that we have developed that improve both the pressure capability, be able to run these engines at much higher pressure and at much higher temperatures, both of which equate to the efficiency uh, of the engine. So we're drawing on those commercial technologies as those have been developed uh, over time and merging them with this uh, adaptive architecture, which is relatively military unique in, in that it plays in a space where there is a wide variety of requirements in a particular mission relative to speed and crews and those types of things, different than our commercial 
uh, product lines. So this perfect storm is happening where we're able to change the trajectory of what propulsion can bring because we bring these efficiency technologies from our commercial business. We make sure that they are compatible with the military cycle, then we merge them with the adaptive cycle feature. So just to give you one example of what those technologies are, uh, GE has bet uh, the farm on ceramic makers composites in both our commercial and these military uh, engines. Uh, invested literally billions of dollars to bring that technology to bear. It's a material that we can put in our hot sections that allows us to run the engines hundreds of degrees hotter than the standard normal uh, alloys that we have used uh, in the past. In fact, today we have commercial engines that are being shipped uh, that have ceramic matrix composites parts in it. Again, where the commercial folks are leading in that uh, particular case and bringing that technology uh, to bear you know, with our customers, commercial customers uh, uh, in that situation. So we're merging those technologies with this adaptive uh, architecture that allows us to get the advantage of that in the military environment as well. And talk to us about getting rid of heat. Um, you know, on the one hand, the aircraft is at high altitude. It's like 30 degrees below zero up there. Uh, you use the fuel tanks because the fuel is very, very cold uh, to handle some of that. Of course, then again, the more fuel you burn off, the less cooling medium you had, which was problem on the Concorde. I mean, uh, you know, that, that too was a challenge. The further you got into a Concorde flight, the hotter the airplane got, and, and, and it would get kind of warm. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you guys are handling that thermal problem, both from a cooling standpoint, but also from a tailpipe standpoint, where you're trying to try to cool that stuff down as much as you can as it's coming out of the back of the airplane, because that's a signature issue. One of the key characteristics of this engine architecture is we've moved to a three-stream engine architecture versus a two-stream engine architecture of the standard turbofan engines that we have today in both military and commercial. The beauty of that third stream is, one, it certainly helps relative to this overall adaptive cycle feature and the way we move air around differently within the engine, but it also provides a wonderful heat sink. The air that's in that third stream is very low compression, so it hasn't picked up a lot of heat due to compression, and, and then it becomes a very uh, perfect heat sink for these types of applications. So we put a lot of heat exchangers in that third stream that are connected to the aircraft thermal management system and basically allow the aircraft system to dump a significant amount of heat into that flow path, the airflow path, rather to your point of using the, the fuel in the fuel tanks, uh, you know, which is historically in you know, fourth generation fighters and all that, uh, that I grew up on, that, that was the way we did it. This third stream provides now a heat sink because we can put heat exchangers in that air stream that is very cold and get a very large uh, delta temperature that helps the aircraft system. One of the challenges with today's aircraft, fifth generation, and the things that we're looking at for the next generation uh, aircraft is they're, they're packed with avionics, radar systems, and a lot of equipment that generates large uh, amounts of heat and the aircraft are no longer aluminum skinned airplanes like we all you know, grew up on. And so they're great insulating you know, fuselages, which again, uh, detracts from the capability of getting heat uh, off of the aircraft. Uh, so we're looking much more to the engines in this new architecture to be able to help uh, resolve that thermal management challenge that the airplanes of uh, today have and that certainly will have in the future. And, and what about what's coming out of the tailpipe? How do you, what are some of the things, and I know this is a very sensitive issue, but what are some of the things you can do at that back end to try to reduce your emitted signature? Well, one of the uh, folks in our uh, uh, technology area once said there's nothing bad about cold air for the back end of the engine. So when you, you know, you're certainly talking about survivability, everybody knows that's a, you know, one of the key uh, design parameters for combat kind types of aircraft. So again, having this third stream of air uh, provides us at least another source to be able to manage heat in the back of the engines uh, for that as aspect as well. Uh, you know, and, and admitting that there are uh, limitations uh, to that. Of course, what's you know you've been in this business for almost four decades, 39 years, uh, despite your youthful uh, good looks. So tell us a little bit about you know what's what's the next thing. You know, you talked about ceramic matrix composite. Um, that was something that for a long time was kind of a holy grail. You guys did very bit bit, bit big on it. Um, there are all sorts of other engine architectures that some of your competitors have also been working with as well. Talk to us a little bit about what you think the next big breakthrough is going to be that everybody's working through. That's going to be sort of the next step change because we're finding that these step changes are actually happening at a far more accelerated pace than we've seen in the past, as you said, you know, going from turbojet to turbo high bypass turbo turbofans and then extreme high bypass turbofans as we're seeing. Talk to us a little bit about what that next leap is going to be like. I think it, you know, from a GE perspective, one of the biggest things that we are just really learning how to uh, 
to, to be, gain the most benefit is the world of additive. You know, there's lots of folks playing in the additive manufacturing space these days. Uh, that is a huge uh, deal with Inside GE. We actually have a standalone additive part of our uh, business uh, now. And it's really trying to figure out how you take advantage of additive. If you're simply printing the same part that you used to make as a casting, you're really not gaining the benefit of what additive brings to, uh, to play. So what we're really learning to do now, and, it, and it's a very big play in the engines that we have in the advanced combat region as well as our commercial business, is how do you open up the design space with the use of additive to be able to design parts that are more efficient relative to whatever their performance characteristic needs to be, but you can now physically make with an additive manufacturing approach that you couldn't make in a casting approach. Um, so we are very heavily into this additive space. We think that, again, is another game changer in the capability that we can provide for propulsion. It appears to be a very significant cycle time benefit from a manufacturing perspective, which is always good, uh, and some certainly some opportunities from a cost perspective. We know both the acquisition cost of these systems, the sustainment cost of these systems is extremely important to the Air Force and the other services as well. So to be able to exploit this whole additive uh, uh, manufacturing process uh, to help with those key uh, items of interest is really big for us. Heat exchangers, for example, uh, on our engines is an area where we have bet big on additive, and they've changed the way we've designed heat exchangers to get much more efficiency out of those heat exchangers, making those heat exchangers lighter than we could using, I'll say, legacy manufacturing processes. Um, I, I'm going to ask you two more questions, um, even though I'm uh, because I, 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 you're, you're busy and you've got to go. But let me ask you about power generation. I mean, one of the big challenges also with these aircraft is they're very, very power hungry. Um, so what was, um, you know, I mean, as, as we see, even when you look at the Poseidon, it has bulges on the cowlings in order to accommodate larger generator sets to produce aircraft power, power for the aircraft. How are you handling that challenge? Because you're still looking at a very confined space. Is it through efficiency? Is it through, how are you guys working on that extra power generation problem? It it's really depends on what the demand signal is. What is the power needed for the aircraft? At least for what we see today in today's aircraft and moving forward, we can use also, <clears throat> I'll say the legacy approach of gearbox power takeoff uh, configurations of some sort, where we're basically pulling power off of the core of the engine and being able to do that still efficiency and, and allow the engine to operate around the flat envelope as it needs to. One of the things that we have done a lot of work in is looking at low pressure spool power takeoff. As we look at potential directed energy weapons and those things down the road where the power requirements of the aircraft now start to double or triple or quadruple, uh, there was probably at some point in time going to be a, be a need to move to pulling power off of the low pressure spool as well as the way we've done it in the past with the high pressure spool. So we've done some testing on a legacy uh, engine where we pulled significant power off of the low pressure spool as well. Uh, that technology is all still in its relative infancy on how you configure the engine to do that. As you say, all of these engines are embedded in the airframe, so it's not like there's a great big space to put uh, uh, a bunch of additional generators. So we're still kind of uh, early in that process from a technology maturation standpoint, but I think at the end of the day will be critical as we look forward in some of these much, much higher demand systems in the aircraft uh, come into play and the engine has to be part of that uh, power solution. And uh, conjoined uh, last question, how long before we see this uh, technology that is uh, ready and available and starting to go to military aircraft, whether or not it's the F-35 or any other uh, uh, power plant? And then talk to us also about the cycle. You know, you've benefited from uh, Boeing, uh, excuse me, uh, General Electric's commercial engines. What, is the commercial, what do the commercial engines guys get from you guys? Okay, so if really from a timing question, we're still in the technology maturation phase. We'll run some engines here in the next couple of years that really validate to the next level of uh, depth of what the technology can provide. And it's now really in the hands of the Air Force uh, leadership over time to decide what's the first application of this technology to get this engine into an aircraft and rubber on the ramp. Uh, and that's yet to be decided. Uh, certainly we're having conversations with them as to what's in the art of the possible from a timing perspective, um, but it really is in the hands of the Air Force to decide you know, where they want to move this from a technology maturation type of program into an engineering and manufacturing development program, an EMD program that would lead to, uh, to production. 
Uh, so timing there is, is uh, we're, we're really as interested in that question as, uh, as you are, and hopefully here uh, sometime in the near future we'll get some, uh, some idea of where that's going. Relative to the commercial uh, folks benefit, that's really been the historic uh, premise in propulsion is we develop technologies uh, in the military world and we find ways to transition those to uh, commercial. That's the way I grew up. We had the F-101 uh, B-1 bomber engine that was developed in the 70s. That engine obviously became the grandfather of the family of combat engines that GE provided for F-16s and F-15s. and previously F-14s before they were retired for the Navy. But we also transitioned that technology to the commercial world. It became the, the uh, cornerstone of the core for the CFM-56 line of engines that was extremely successful for us. So there, that's been the way that transition has happened in the past. Now some of the technologies that we're developing in the commercial uh, space obviously are coming back as we've talked into the military. The things that we're doing in the military is trying to help push some of those technologies a little bit further than the commercial guys need today. So for example, ceramic makers composites, there's a current temperature capability that's used in the commercial world that we're using in the baseline uh, designs of these military engines today. But we're also putting uh, company funded development money into those technologies to help push that, tech, that uh, temperature capability even further in the areas of things like CMCs, which will help us from a future generation uh, military propulsion, but would then also be able to be applied to the commercial world as they, again, continue to claw for fuel efficiency in uh, future models of, uh, of their engines as well. And CMC is? Ceramic Matrix Composites. There you go. All right, Dan, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed the conversation. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time.